Burma is one of my favorite places in the world, which is why I've been going there for probably more than three decades. Burma evokes both curiosity and inspiration. I know the country very well and have many favorite places, which I would love to share with you. I would like to invite you to join me there during my workshop in February of 2021. We will be working together and I'll be sharing with you my suggestions for light and composition, locations, uh, my approach to portraits, approaching people and, and landscapes. We'll explore some hidden places in Mandalay, as well as some well-known places I've been documenting for years, like the World Heritage Sites at Bagan. We will take part in Buddhist ceremonies, see historical sites, and fully immerse ourselves in the Burmese culture. People in Burma are extremely friendly, very willing to be photographed, and very proud of their culture and their heritage. It's a wonderful, safe place to create unforgettable images. Hope to see you there. Hello and welcome to today's Better Moments webinar. My name is Laura Graf and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager of Better Moments. I'm excited that so many people could join us today for this very special occasion. I do see some familiar faces in the audience, but a lot of new ones as well. So we would love to know from where you're all joining tonight. So you can use the chat tool to share your name and location with us and to say hi to everybody else. Tonight, you also have the possibility to ask questions. Uh, please use the Q&A tool for this, and we will address your questions throughout and after the talk. So just keep them coming. One thing, it would be fantastic if you could add your name and country to the question so that we have a bit of information about you. But now let's welcome one of the most important photographers of our time, Steve McCurry. Some of you may have already met him at one of his fantastic exhibitions around the world or have even traveled with him on a photography workshop. Steve is the creator of some of the world's most iconic photographs. He has not only taken the photo of the famous Afghan girl, but also covered the monsoon season in India, the Gulf War, the war in Afghanistan and 9-11. Steve is also a longtime member of Magnum and has received multiple awards for his work, among them the World Press Photo Award. So welcome, Steve, and thank you for being here with us tonight. It's a pleasure to join you. I'm, uh, at the moment, I'm in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Great. Um, with me today is also Betterman CEO Christian Nogard. Steve and Christian have been working together for over 10 years. Christian has organized many of Steve's exhibition in Scandinavia, worked with him on a film project and organized multiple photography workshops together with Steve. So without further ado, let's get started. Christian and Steve, the stage is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, Christian. Hey, Steve. So, so what, perfect to be online with you. And Laura, would you start the slideshow? Um, and I, I will actually ask you some questions during the slideshow, Steve, that people have sent to us. And uh, the, one of the first is actually about the Afghan girl. And we have a question from Alex, uh, who would like to hear the story behind this iconic portrait. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, uh, you know, I was in a refugee camp. I was in a, in a, right after the refugee camp in 1984, and I just happened to, uh, I was in a school and uh, I asked the teacher, I, I was very, I walked into the classroom and I saw this incredible little girl um, and uh, with these incredible eyes and uh, I knew right away that she was a powerful portrait. She could be a powerful portrait. And so I asked the teacher if I could, um, you know, photograph her and photograph the class and whatnot, and she agreed. I mean, I, you know, I had permission from the camp and the government and all that. So I, I made a few portraits. I, I knew it was a strong image, but I never dreamed uh, it would end up being so iconic. Uh, I made the picture, uh, and I didn't actually, on film, I didn't see the picture for about six weeks. <laughs> realized um, you know how powerful that picture was and uh, it was uh, you know it was in this sort of dark tent 
with Kodachrome film. Uh, it was done in a very, you know, quick way. Um, and I, I literally just uh, was, a, I had to kind of work very fast and um, hoped that, you know, it was sharp because of, uh, you know, it was probably at a 60th of a second. Uh, I was on a tripod. So it was, it was, uh, you know, it was one of those once in a lifetime situations. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve. Laura, will you go ahead with some new slides, please? Yes. When you feel about it, Steve, you can talk over the pictures. Uh, uh, we have quite a lot, so maybe we just go by the flow. And if you feel to say something about one or another, you just. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, that's the, uh, these monks in, in China, um, the Shaolin monks who uh, do all these kind of feats of strength and endurance and discipline. Uh, I, I was just really surprised, the first adherents there were, how many you know, Chinese were fascinated and dedicated to this uh i don't know school of uh martial arts they there were i don't know it seemed dozens of schools in this particular area and uh you know very young you know kids uh, i don't know 12 or 15 uh and these were uh, incredible to see their uh the physicality and what they could actually do mm. uh, because you know, most kids at that age are out playing football or basketball or whatever. These kids were doing all sort of martial arts. It was, it was, it was really, uh, I, I, was, I was at another school just last year in China. Mm -hmm. And it was just uh, very serious, very dedicated. And it was, uh, I, I just was uh, amazed at the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. whole, you know, the whole idea that the, uh, the, this martial arts and how they could be so dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lau, could you go to the next, some of the next slides? Oh, this is, uh, yeah, I, I did, I spent about six weeks or two months uh, or more on a train journey across India. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, now, light, the train in India is like uh, it's it's like a microcosm of the culture. There's people live on the platforms and they're traveling vast distances. And I, I was always enjoyed going by train because you can meet all kinds of fascinating people. Um, and uh, your whole you know you're eating on the train, sleeping on the train, and people are getting on, getting off. It, it was. Uh, Really wonderful way to uh, learn about India and mm. to, you know, it's just really kind of in depth. Um, and, and the backdrop, Steve, is, isn't that the Taj Mahal, if I'm not wrong? Yeah, it's the Taj Mahal, yeah. an old steam locomotive, mm. which they're all pretty much gone now. Those, all those yeah. steam locomotives are really history now. And um, there was a one track. It went very close to the Taj. It was it was a shunting track, and they would uh, move the locomotives in and out. And they did this. It was it operated like twenty four hours a day. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time in this railroad yard, photographing their operation uh, with uh, the Taj in the background. Nice. Now, would you go walk us through some new ones? Oh yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> that's one of the, the mother and child at the car. Yeah, that, that's yeah. Uh, you know this really for me was kind of the collision of two worlds, uh, where you have um, this mother and child coming to the car window for you know feeling for some money, and. Uh, it was there were always a different traffic mm -hmm. light 
and I was in the car, this air conditioned car. And um, it, it was, you know, it, we only stopped for a moment and she came up and the child looked in the window. And then uh, as soon as I picked up the camera just instinctively and then uh, the light changed and went. I believe it's it's from uh, Bombay, isn't that right? Uh, in India, is yeah. that right? Yeah, it, it's about, uh, yeah, it's about uh, I don't know, twenty five years ago or so. Yeah, I actually have some information here, so I can tell you it's from ninety three, actually. <laughs> yeah, so it's some more, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, now, yeah, sorry. It's yeah, it's one of those cases where you. Um, it's an instinctive, it's a kind of, you're working kind of more, uh, not thinking so deeply. I saw mm. something with the camera, made two exposures, the light changed and we left. And I kind of forgot about it. After. As Laura said before, that I have had the honor to host some of your exhibitions. And this, this, this image is actually one, uh, extremely powerful. I, I mean, people will walk around an exhibition but when you get to this picture, of some reason, not of many reasons, of course, but they really stick there for a while. It really brings up um, quite a lot of emotional feelings in all of us. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, a powerful image. Mm -hmm. um, so much of the world uh, mm -hmm. lives them. Um, and they're kind of desperate and uh, are, are looking for some help. Yeah, and it, it breaks your heart. Absolutely. Laura? Yes. Could you go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is also from uh, from Dubai in Bombay. Yeah. Uh, just a straight. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was kind of otherworldly, this uh, mosque and uh, taxis and people bustling around. It's, you know, uh, one of the most interesting cities in the world. I've been there many, many times. And it's just, uh, you know, visually rich. Mm. Uh, in fact, I would say that a significant part of my career has been in Asia, you know, uh, India, Burma. Pakistan and Afghanistan. So this is part of the world that really speaks to me in a in a deep way. Mm, absolutely. I actually have a question from the from the audience that might fit in here um, from David. He asked, "What fascinates you so much about countries like India and Burma?" Well, I think that you you have um, an ancient world and this uh, modern world and this sort of clash. You have people in uh, these countries that are living very traditionally, perhaps even the way they may have lived 100 or 200 years ago. But you also had this sort of ultra modern uh, world going on, kind of juxtaposed. Uh, that's one part that's fascinating. You have extremes, extreme you know, poverty, extreme wealth, um, and, and again, there Coexisting against. Uh, you also have this very ancient uh, culture which goes back, you know, thousands of years. Hinduism and Buddhism, and uh, it, it, it's very more. It's much more visible, I think, in uh, their their religion, their faith, than what we have here. Uh, in the my, my senses, in the U.S. It, it's more. It's more inside. It's more uh, in a church, and uh, there it's more public. Outside, it's more more colorful. I think color in uh, particularly Hinduism and Buddhism play a much more significant role, the role of color, than in, in say religions of the West, which tend to be more colorless. Uh, so I think that. Um, that also is part, an important part of the story. That the yeah. story of these cultures. <clears throat> Do 
but uh, I've been back so many times and there's always something new to see. Uh, you also have the diversity of races, religion, Muslims and the Christians, the Buddhists, the Jains, the Farsis, Parsis, uh, uh, and, and um, it, it's just this mix, incredible mix of uh, faith and, and religion. So that also adds to the kind of the spice of this part. Yeah. Uh, there was a question actually, Steve, from a guy in the United States asking about the picture we were looking at right here. Uh, the story behind it. Uh, I mean, this, those questions goes on and on again, but right here, I, I just saw it for this one. The story behind this photo of this boy running here in this galley. Well, there's this very uh, wonderful festival in India called Holi, and it's a festival of color, and people traditionally throw color, uh, very friendly, uh, and it happens pr primarily in certain parts of Rajasthan in India. And uh, during all this color uh, throwing, they also put hand print just in more of a playful way and more of kind of a folk art way on the walls in different places. So these, th there was nothing really particularly significant about the hand prints, but what, it was, what struck me about the scene was the graphic kind of nature and <clears throat> In this alleyway, people were going, and it, I, as I stood there watching the the frame, the picture, uh, it suddenly occurred to me that this was uh, there was the, the design was really so. I made a I, I stayed there for mm -hmm. like an hour, or I photographed, and um, then I left, and I got back to the hotel that night. I was kind of looking through my work. And I, I noticed that this was really an interesting situation. So I went back again uh, the next day and spent some more time, uh, again, photographing uh, people walking, coming and going. And um, I, I just thought it was a really wonderful uh, combination of, uh, of a particular design, a composition, uh, the color, the, the mix of, of people going so that that's what mm. caught my that's why i was so fascinated with this yeah absolutely Lauer? i actually have another question yeah. that taps in there um from emmanuel asking since you're speaking of color if you could tell us about your very specific color scheme well i, I think that color is the world is in color we see the, 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 world, it's a, the world's in color, so it makes more sense, more logical, it's more authentic to photograph the world, you know, as it is. Uh, I love black and white too, but that's more of a taking that part of the, taking that element out of the scene, out of the picture, uh, it simplifies it certainly, and in some ways, you know, you're able to concentrate more on the emotion. Sometimes color is actually too much information but because the world that we live in is in color i prefer to photograph it like like that and um i'm always looking at <clears throat> different things simultaneously composition the particular story and um i always had my eye on color I don't want the color to be so overpowering. I, I don't want to overpower the story, the action, what's happening. Um, you know, what the picture's about. I don't want the picture to be only about color. I want it to be, have some human element, uh, have some emotional element. I think that color can sort of add to that but I don't want the color to over, overwhelm it. So you're constantly looking and trying to find things that inspire you and things that strike your eye. And it's just a question of, of, of 
practice and experience to see what in the end sort of makes sense. What mm. would make visual sense in your picture? Oh yeah, I love this. Oh yeah. This yeah. Is this the train picture of the bicycles? Or? Yeah, is the train. If you go back, Laura, just one there. Yeah, that's the train, Steve, with the bicycles. Yeah. Um, so, again, I spent, I don't know, a month and a half or more in India photographing life on the train. And uh, these people had, were going to market and, and just for convenience, just to be, they, attach their their bicycles to the outside of the train in order to get to their to their destination with less uh i don't know stress or, or effort or mm. maybe and all that so i just I, I thought it was a very ingenious way to, to to take advantage of of the fact that you can get your bike on the train and go for maybe if you and off yeah. Do we have any pictures of a? Excuse me. I, I said, do we have any pictures of Burma? But yeah, we kind of come to Burma in, in a second. Yeah. Okay. This one, Steve, is is from from the war, I believe. It's from. Um, it, it, yeah. Can you check? It's from uh, Kuwait, isn't it? As I remember. Yeah, it's from a. Uh, it was during the war, Gulf War in '92, I believe, and um, you know the they had there were like hundred oil fire, and it was this catastrophic environmental uh, problem, and um, the. Uh, because of all the smoke and whatnot, uh, <laughs> there were a few animals in this area who were looking for water, looking for food, trying to find a way to escape. And I just one day happened to be in the oil field driving through it, and I saw this herd of camels. I don't know, mm -hmm. they were looking for, I guess, for food and water. And I, I, I was so, uh, I, I was waiting for, a, for some more light, it was very dark. And I kind of followed them, uh, waiting for a bit of light so that I could actually, you know, see them. And then we came across this bit of uh, fire. Uh, so I was able to get out and just, I, I, maybe I made 10 pictures, I don't know. And then I, uh, then, then they left and I, we came back. But we were actually in a, in a minefield. We realized we were oh, yeah? literally in a minefield, uh, which was very frightening. So it, it was a very, <laughs> and uh, we were a, 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 a long way from a hospital <laughs> or from wow. help and no phones, you know, no, no chance for help. That's actually yeah. a good question from, from the audience too, actually. I just combine them. So Alex and Luca are asking, um, if you cover those historical events like 9-11 or the Gulf War, uh, how do you deal with the pain and suffering of the people in, in the photos? How do you separate yourself in that moment and shoot those wonderful photos? Well, I, I, th I think if you're trying to record uh, the, the situation, you're documenting what's going on, I think you have to put those emotions aside and understand, realize that you have a sort of a you have a mission to to tell those to tell that story. And I think somehow separate your emotions and uh and your your kind of personal view of it to some extent and 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 do the best you can to record and to photograph document 
what you see. And um, because it, I think that we need to remember these kind of things. We need to have some record. I think the, you know, the way we get our information and how we learn about the world that we live in <clears throat> is by, you know, pictures and television and whatnot. So I think it's a duty for some of us to go out and tell these stories. Um, but it's, it's haunting, as you can imagine, uh, to kind of recollect, uh, uh, you know, all this loss of life and, uh, you know, the, the, the human life, the, the, the wildlife, um, the destruction of, you know, the, the environment was, took a huge hit. Mm. And for months, uh, I guess it's still recovering after almost 30 years. But uh, yeah, I think you just have to try and com compartmentalize uh, your emotion and try and kind of defer that to another time when you can kind of process it better. But to try and think too deeply about it, I think at that moment, I think you have to go more work from your gut and more mm. instincts and try just to do the best you can to tell that story. Absolutely. Laura, would you take us through some, some more slides? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can stop on this one here. I believe this is from Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Is that right? Isn't that the, the big temple in the background? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's Angkor Wat. Yeah, yeah. I, I spent a lot of time uh, in Angkor Wat, uh, maybe several months, and uh, this was uh, you really felt like you were going back in time. These temples were uh, so majestic, and and uh, but there were people actually living um, nearby the temple. There were there was uh, a couple monasteries, in fact, that were nearby. So th 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 these people would harvest these lotus, and they would uh, take them home and cook them and eat them. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in, at night, yeah, it was, it was really fascinating. I, I loved, uh, I loved Vancouver. I love to go back again. I imagine uh, there's a lot more tourism there now than there was before. Oh, yeah. uh, when I was there, there were uh, there were a number of tourists, but it wasn't the way it is now. So uh, it's pretty... it was kind of more mm. raw, you know, back then. Can you walk, give us some more slides in an hour? Steve, when we now when we are walking through some of the pictures, there's uh, Ashmit Rai. I could would think he's from India. Who ask you how do you approach people when you caption when you're taking your photos, so to speak? How do I how do I approach people? people? Yeah, capture oh. people exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I try and do it in a very um, relaxed way. Um, I, I try and be very respectful. I, I think that you have to, um, um, first of all, I think you need to meet people and talk to people before you start photographing. I, I don't think you ever want to sort of, um, you know, whip your camera out right away. I think you, you want to be slow and deliberative. And um, uh, I think that works better than, uh, but I, I think that you need to look people in the eye and smile and, uh, be very respectful. I, I think it's very simple. I don't think it's particularly complicated, but you just have to be, um, you know, curious and, um, and uh, you know, smile and, and treat people in the right way. And I think that uh, people will open up and allow you to yeah. photograph. Um, Again, I think most people are very happy to cooperate and to um, 
help you and your you know picture. Um, and some people don't, and that's okay too. I think mm. you just have to uh, work with people that are uh, you know that, that agree and yeah. uh, don't want to be fun. Isn't that if you awesome? go, uh -huh. yeah, Lau, if you go one image back here, uh, I this 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 shot is from Africa. I think it's from Omo probably. You've been working in Africa as well, Steve. I know we all know you've been working a lot in Asia, but you also have done some quite amazing, nice work in Africa. Isn't that right? Oh yeah, yeah. I've been to Africa many times. We we went to to Ethiopia together. Um, yeah. I've worked in Africa for you know, thirty years. Uh, I think Ethiopia is one of the more um, you know visually interesting country. They they have the beautiful people and regions there. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 each part of the world offers a kind of a unique, interesting, uh, different cultures and climate and geography and, and uh, religions. And, and I, I always, uh, you know, going to Ethiopia is, I think my favorite country in, in Africa as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that, that's, I agree with you. It's a, Amazing country, very nice people. Yeah, now. I know, Steve, that you're working on this project is, uh, with from around the world where people are reading their books, isn't that right? And this this was one of many I've seen with, with uh, people sitting with books and newspapers and so on. Uh, that's a project, is that right? Well, doing all sorts of activities since, uh, I don't know, 50 years now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, reading, people reading in different places has been um, something I've, I've always been interested in. People reading, working. Stop here now, yeah. Yeah. I'll just ask Laura to, to make a stop here because now we're actually back uh, in, in New York. I believe this is 9-11. Uh, uh, is, is that right as well? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know that you actually, when you start off as a photographer, you, you went to Afghanistan uh, and was covering quite a lot of, of wars in, in Afghanistan. Isn't that right as well? Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, 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 but uh, it was just that I think that this is a, a very strong shot from 9 11 as well that really tells the story. Um, in a wow, yeah, oh, yeah, was, uh, you know, that was a day that none of us will ever forget. It was, uh, again, it was one of those times when you just have to put your emotions aside and go down and try and do the best job you could mm. to a record of what was happening that day. And uh, it was terrible. And, but I, I just, I knew that this was something which we needed to remember and have a record that it actually happened. Mm. Uh, I agree. Yeah. With visual proof, uh, you know, there's, you can always question, oh, you know, did it really, did it ever happen? But here you go, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, now. Where's this from? This, if you go, I just, I've seen it so many times, Steve. I probably have asked you many times as well. Where are we right here? Is that, is that Yemen or? Uh, yeah, uh, Yemen. This is Yemen, uh, okay. Yeah, it's a place I guess, I guess now sort of closed. I'm not sure that you could even kind of go there. So much of the world has mm. changed in places which, well, because of COVID too, but so many places um, which we could all go to at one time, Afghanistan, mm. Iran, um, you know, Yemen. Uh, there's so many places that are closed now because of civil war uh, or other problems so yeah, yeah. 
that's that's the case in this area. Yeah, absolutely. I think the next slide is we are moving to Burma now. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a. Yes, amazing. Uh, it has this wonderful culture, which again is a very gentle people, uh, very easy to photograph. People are generally happy and willing to meet you and be, photo you know. Uh, there's a really wonderful vibe there of, uh, I don't know, I just, the, the, the Buddhist culture, uh, th th there's so much there that is uh, uh, the monasteries and the temples and the monks. And the people are very hospitable. It's mm. really uh, visit people's homes, uh, go into the monasteries and the temples. There's very, it's very open, it's very little restriction. And, I rarely ever have anybody object to mm. uh, photography. People are more than happy to invite you in and spend time with you. And uh, they tell you, you know, their story and, you know, you have a kind of a wonderful, create this kind of relationship. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Can we see some more, Laura? I think we have oh, some. Of course. Nice handful from. That is actually a place we have been by uh, together as well. This uh, place before, Steve. It's that's outside the uh, Mandalay. This one here. Yeah, it's across uh, the. Been gone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it, this enormous uh, pagoda. It's a brick. It looks like maybe it's a big a rock face, but in fact, it's just uh, literally hundreds of millions of bricks that make up this facade. Mm. It's a magical place. Getting there is magical. And um, walking around this enormous structure, realizing that it's hundreds and hundreds of years old, and it, this was, it's like going to the pyramids. Yeah, and I agree with you. You know, uh, yeah, they're just. Now that yes. you're into, yes. into Burma, there's a question from Craig. He asked, what would you say is your favorite location there in terms of photography and also in terms of connecting with the locals? Well, I think the one place that is, um, offers the most is, is Mandalay. Uh, you have the Irrawaddy River uh, there, so you had this incredible river life. In fact, you could probably spend your whole time just on the river, but that's one aspect. And you have a uh, monastic uh, life of monks and, and temples, and also something which is I'm endlessly fascinated with monastery how Buddhism is integral to their lives and how kind of visual it is. Um, you, you have wonderful neighborhoods you can walk through and get to know people and photograph. Uh, the, the modern part of Mandalay is less <coughs> interesting to me. It's more the traditional. Uh, and it kind of across the river, you have this incredible pagoda. And uh, the way over and the way back is uh, you're on a river, on a ferry, and it's... Uh, Life you have again on the other side is you have these wonderful kind of uh, monasteries. There's this there's this old folks home which I, I always try and go to with all these very old people that are, are, are has these incredible faces mm. and they're very happy to meet visitors and be photographed and uh, I always find that just endlessly uh, rich photographically. It's just amazing. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to see a few more of those photos. Yeah. Melta asks if there's a place in uh, Burma that you have not yet visited, but would like to visit, and why? Well, I think that's far north. A lot, a lot, of, a, a lot of Burma, you need special permits mm -hmm. for various reasons. There's certain areas where there's, uh, uh, of course, in the West have the uh, 
Rohingya situation. So there's places there which are like out of reach. Uh, I guess if I could choose, I would go to some place in the north, uh, way up near uh, the Himalayan region. But again, it's difficult to get there. You need permits. And I I'm just as happy working in places that are less restricted, which are open, no problem. Um, it, it, so the challenge is really more photographic than it is trying to get a permit uh, to go to a place which is restricted. So um, I'm more than happy to go to Agon, uh, Mandalay, Yangon, Inlay Lake. Uh, mm. I, I think so much. <clears throat> You know, it's so much of Burma that they, they, they do things in, many times in a, in a different way, in an old way, in a traditional way. And you go there and you can sort of see what life, you know, must have been like 100 years ago when we, in, in the West or in Europe or the U.S., we still would go out in a fishing boat and, 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 and fish or we would... Um, you know, grow our own food or, or do things uh, in a more manual way. I, I always find it kind of a glimpse into the past, uh, you know, a shepherd with his or her flock of goats or sheep or, or whatever, or cattle or, or whatnot. It, it's just, uh, I, I just, it's always a pleasure to get up in the morning. Sometimes you get up at sunrise and go out and work until sunset because there's just so much to see and to do. And the, the weather is, is always perfect because it's, it's, it's warm. So you never have to worry about, you know, mm. coats and uh, it, it only rains, the time of the year which I generally go to, it doesn't rain. Rarely. <laughs> so you have weather. The month, though, I got to say, is a very exciting time to be there to photograph it because the, the rain is so dramatic and you have uh, sometimes sort of too much rain or not enough rain. It's floods or famine or drought. It, it becomes very... Uh, dramatic um, because it, often these are agricultural societies and they depend on the rain so it's kind of a, a matter of life and death sometimes. Talking about that Steve, there's a person from Italy, Giulano, who's asking what is your favorite pictures? Is that portrait or is it landscape? If you could. I always prefer people. I always prefer photographing people doing things or people with with a, a strong expression or uh, uh, people uh, in, in their traditional way they adorn themselves where they dress uh, and workers I, I just I'm fascinated with how we see each other how we uh, I come from a kind of a you know western background and to see these people who come from a completely different frame of res reference and a completely different culture and to see how we, and to meet and to kind of marvel and be fascinated and curious about each other. I, I think it's one of the best things you can do in life is to travel and, and actually people that have a different cultural background. And, and Burma's one of the best places to do that because it's extremely safe and, um, uh, and rich visually. Yeah. This is one of the long neck women also from Burma, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Well, yes. this, there's, uh, 
th this was a woman who was actually working in the field and uh, we came to her village. Uh, she wasn't that way for tourists. She wasn't, you know, she was authentic. Mm. Uh, this is actually the way she looked. And there, there were no other tourists in that area. Yet, again, I had to have special permission from the, from the military to, to get to that area. Um, and uh, again, you just are amazed at how that system, how it could have evolved. How could people devise that system of jewelry or orna ornamentation? I mean, human nature and human civilization has come up with some amazing solutions and ideas and, 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 and fashion of how we dress and, and mm. go about the world. Yeah. Laura, can you check us a little bit further? There's actually a question from Alex who asks, the, um, women seem to be an important subject in your work. Why is that? Well, I think women are important, men are important, children. Um, I, I don't think you think it's, I, I, um, I, I love photographing um, sort of everybody, whether they're young or old. I think we all have our own particular story and, and different stages of life offer different way we behave and look. So, um, yeah, I think uh, women are, are part of the human story, the most important part of the human story, no doubt. Uh, and um, mothers and wives and sisters. And, and, and w women in, in many parts of the world are doing the heavy lifting in the family cooking, taking care of the children. You often see them going out to get firewood and they do all the work. I'm not sure what the men do. I guess they go out and try and make some money. <laughs> but doing uh, the, most of the work. Um, you know, clean the clothes, everything. It all falls to the woman. So they're, they're the heroes, really. And I'm... Un, un, often it's a thankless existence that they're living. Uh, um, if they, you know, I think in the future, the women will take a stronger role in society, and I, I'm sure that'll be for the best. Because we met, as men, we haven't done all that great of a job so far. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. You, I have three girls at home. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Are we getting so many uh, nice questions for you? And a lot of people is very happy about this. This uh, guy, he has to be from Denmark. He's he's saying very power. His name is Ashburn Hansen. That's as dense as it can get. Hey Steve, very po powerful shots. I really like this show. We have um, from Italy as well, who really is a it's an amazing show. Thank you so much, Steve. And then of course we have questions in all directions. And uh, here's what, some of those who goes more into which kind of equipment that you are using uh, when you're working. And uh, Rajet, uh, he's asking you, he's probably from India, I would think, what is your uh, focus lens? Which lens is your number one lens uh, for your work? Well, when I was shooting film, I was always shooting like a fixed focal length lens, 50, 35. 85 or, or whatever. Uh, now that I'm shooting digital, I found myself using primarily uh, zoom lenses. Um, I, I try and keep the lens on the camera all the time. I don't, I don't like to change lenses so much. And um, I'm using uh, what I think is, uh, I use a 24 to 90, it's a, a, a Leica lens. I, I'm using the Leica. S2, uh, incredible camera. I think the, I think probably the best camera I've ever used. Incredible results. I, I actually did a test with 
with my SL2 with other cameras I've used in the past, and it just was whoa! I thought it was the difference. <laughs> was, so when you did, for for you, Steve, when you say uh, your definition of 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 quality for camera, what would that be? Is that is it doable or is it the uh, the structures, the, the highlights, the shadows, or you know, what are you looking for? Is it, it's when you well, define? It, yeah, I think you want the camera to uh, try and render the scene the way you saw it. I think you see a whatever it is that you're looking at photograph. You want the camera to tell that story in the best possible way. I, I think that. Um, in my case, uh, I'm looking for clarity and sharpness and the, the color rendition is, is superb. Um, it's a very logical camera to work. Uh, very, the functionality is, 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 is very easy. But uh, I think in a camera, you want durability. Mm. Uh, th that's what you, you know, you, you want to have a camera. You, you, you don't want to be thinking about the camera and that 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 piece of equipment that the, you want to be thinking about your what you're photographing um, so you want the camera function to be kind of in the, in the background uh, but you want it also to make the best possible picture and i think um and i think it depends on what you're looking for in your work i mean there's no mm. right wrong I think you can make some wonderful pictures with a with a Holga or with a plastic camera or with with whatever camera you want a pinhole camera. It just depends on what you want to do. Uh, for me, I, I want clarity. I want sharpness. Uh, I want a picture to be able to blow up uh, large. Have that possibility. Mm. Maybe all pictures. You don't want them large, some you do, some don't, but I want to have that capability. So um, that, that's important to me. Um, and you want to, we can, uh, you, you know, that the, the, the doesn't blow out the highlights and you have shadow detail. And again, maybe some people don't care about that and that's fine. Again, photography is all about what, gives you some kind of create, create, you know, satisfies your creative urge, um, your creative impulse, uh, telling your story um, in the way that, you know, you want it told. So it, it just depends on what, what interests you and what fulfills you artistically and creatively and uh, it, what one solution doesn't, I, I don't like to dictate too much rules about photography because you should be free, uh, you know, to kind of work in your own way. Mm. Whether it's a black, I think that whether it's a, a view camera, eight by ten view camera, or a, a small automatic, or you know, a plastic camera, it just depends on what you want to do. But it's all wrong way. Uh, Laura has this, has the slides going in the background when we've been talking, Steve. And most of those pictures have actually been from Burma. And uh, there is a, a question here about Burma. Uh, uh, no, that's actually the one who have been asking before. It's another one here from Michael, who have been traveling with us actually for some few years ago. He's asking about, Steve, when you're doing your wonderful books, how do you select your pictures? Uh, how is that process for you? Is it, how is it? That's the question, actually. Well, I think you go through it and, you know, certain pictures are more successful. Some pictures you think uh, tell a, you know, a story which is important. You find maybe some profound moment and you go through your work and, um, I think those good pictures rise to the surface and, and it's just a magical, mystical thing why sometimes some pictures uh, really speak to us 
uh, and other ones don't. It's, it's, it's always a bit of a mystery. But I, I like to mm -hmm. go through and find the pictures which I think have special meaning to me, which tell a certain story about the world and about life, about humanity. Um, and I like to try and find pictures which work together with this, the juxtaposition of pictures, the sequencing of pictures and how they relate to each other, where maybe one picture is in Cuba and another picture is in Ethiopia or Burma or Russia. But I like to put pictures together and see how they, they, they work in a book mm. in a sequence. Um, and um, there, there's some pictures are mysterious, which uh, I think maybe don't give us any, uh, they're the thought provoking and sometimes you don't, you know, it's a, you kind of make, make up your own interpretation of the picture. And I love that about photography that you can sometimes see a picture, it's a bit ambiguous and you kind of come up with a, your own interpretation uh, about the thing. Mm -hmm. Book, it's just, it's a, sometimes it's like a poem. Uh, sometimes you, you, it's a poem you put together and it, you know, it, it makes some kind of a statement about the world, you felt about the world at that particular time in life. This yeah. month, yeah. you know, in the morning, that, that's really, quite an experience to see how they go out and collect their food in the morning. I'm, I'm always fascinated by this, this dance, this choreography between the monks and the people who donate and how that whole process takes place seamlessly. They walk and they're just and they move. It's really a, it's really a cultural uh, piece of culture which you just don't see any place else in the world. The community dating mm. to the monks and they do that. They walk around for an hour, maybe two in the morning and they collect all their food for, for the day. Amazing. There's a, a woman here asking Steve, she's from Belgium. Her name is Elise. Hey Steve, uh, this is Elise from Belgium. I wonder what your most favorite picture that you have taken is that you have taken. She's asking, which, do you have one picture that is more important for you than other pictures you have been taking? Well, I never really single out kind of one picture. I think different pictures, you love different pictures for different reasons. Sometimes emotional reasons, sometimes you remember how difficult it was to make the picture. So I never really have like one picture. I, sometimes I have stories or places or whatever, but not one. I, I hate to almost think of them. You don't want to have a favorite. And sometimes it's the color, sometimes it's the story, sometimes it's the, the moment that was, you, you caught something suddenly and it was just a little, and sometimes you, travel someplace for two or three days and uh, it, it, you know, it took you going and coming. It's a, maybe you climb up the top of a mountain <laughs> and it, you love it because it was so difficult to make. Yeah. So I'm in charge of time. And uh, we are slowly running out, so we have a few more questions from the audience that we will address. Uh, but we, before we do that, I would like to say a few words about our upcoming workshop together, because we are traveling to Burma. Um, even better moments, we'll do a workshop from the 19th to the 27th of February. And on this workshop, we will both go to the Mandalay. As Steve mentioned, it's a very interesting city, but we will also go to the UNESCO heritage site in Bagan. And if you would like to travel with Steve and spend nine days with him with hands-on lessons and theory workshops, then you can check our website for more information. 
And for this special occasion today, we have an offer for everyone who's participating. If you sign up for the Burma workshop today, we only have a few seats left, so you should be quick. Um, yeah, if you sign up today, we will take you on a private city tour one day before the workshop starts and we will show you Mendeley. You will meet the rest of the group, get introduced to Mendeley and also our local assistants who will travel with us through Burma to show us the best the country has to offer. Um, since it's a pandemic currently, as we all know, uh, you will receive a full refund on the workshop price if we have to cancel due to coronavirus. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, but back to the questions. We can do a few more, I think. Um, there's actually an interesting one from Niklas from Sweden. He is asking, are you ever afraid that a country may be offended by an image, that an image can be interpreted as criticism of the country? Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes that's a good thing. I think it just depends on the situation. I think it's a case by case basis. It's hard to kind of generalize. Um, I mean, obviously, you always have to treat a country or a culture or individual with, you know, dignity and respect. Um, I think, though, that we're, uh, I think criticism is sometimes a good thing. I think we should all be willing to face the critics and different ideas and different points of view, because it just depend, depends on how it's done. But, uh, you never want to be disrespectful, but I do think that sometimes um, uh, an outsider can come in and look at a place or a situation with another point of view. But it's really a case by case. It's hard to answer that question in, in, in kind of a generality, in, in a general way. You really need to be, uh, think of, because uh, obviously you don't want to, coming in, be arrogant and and think that you can um, criticize a culture uh, without, uh, I mean, that that's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, I disagree with a lot of, a lot of people disagree with me, but we all have to respect each other. And um, it, it's just a kind of a case by case, I think. Mm -hmm. And in terms of photographing people, there are a few, few uh, audience members asking, if you ask for permission first, because this will rather lead yeah. to a staged shot instead of a natural one. I think that, you know, it, there's a couple different ways of approaching portraiture or photographing people. And if you're on a street corner and you're photographing passersby and whatnot, uh, that's sort of one thing. I, I generally, if I'm photographing workers, um, I think it's always best to get permission so that you're, you're much more free to work, and you're not uh, worried that maybe uh, you'll be offensive or whatever. I, I think, you know, most people are more than happy to be photographed, and um, especially if you want to make their portrait, um, and, and the people will always, I, I, in Burma, rarely, almost never do people. Uh, disagree uh, if, if you ask in the right way. So that's, um, but I, I think that you just have to be, uh, you know, sensitive and careful how you approach people. Mm -hmm. um, which is also interesting, do you actually ask for a, or do you have them sign a model release statement since some of the photos are used in editorials? I, I never, I've never, I don't even think once have asked somebody to sign a release. Uh, if I'm doing a corporate advertising or something commercial, uh, you know, that's a story. But generally, I don't run around with a lot of paper. Mm. Uh, I don't know, it just depends on what you want to do with the pictures, I guess, if you're trying to sell them or, I don't know. I, I've never had a problem uh, with model releases. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a different story in different parts of the world, uh, but where I go, it's never, never an issue. Mm -hmm. 
I know that that we can go on for the whole night actually with Christian Steve, but I, I think on behalf of all of us, uh, I will just from a humble heart say thank you very much. It has been extremely inspiring. And um, I can see on, on the right side of my laptop, I can see all the Christians, all the people who have been joining in, and they're all very happy about this. There's even a hello to Lucy, uh, Helena, who was trained with us last year. <laughs> so there's friends here who have been trained with us, Steve. And also from Lisbeth, I can tell she was trained with us. So um, it's like a little bit like being in the family and be from all over the world at the very same time. Um, so, should we have the last question, Laura, and then uh, that would be fine for me. Uh, what do you think, Steve, do you have spirit for one more question? No. Sure, be happy to. Hey, by the way, I yeah. just like to make a point about our, our guides in Burma and how extraordinary. I think the, the best guides I've ever worked with are in, in Burma. I, I've known these guys for of 15 years and they're just extraordinary. They're really, really great with, uh, with yeah, the staff, the local people and all of that. It's, it's really, uh, really amazing. I'm trying to attend to my daughter right now. <laughs> she's she's uh, trying to do something. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Said my best regards as well, Steve. That's really yeah, nice. yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's true. It, and it's true what you just said that that our local guides uh, shine and uh, oh, they're amazing. Yeah, I mean they, very... they they make miracles happen. These guys. I mean, I wish I had a a shine in every place I go. <laughs> Because uh, they're able to literally, uh, uh, you know, turn a no into a yes, and just uh, they're like a, they're like magicians, and they they show their uh, their enthusiasm is infectious, and uh, they they love their culture, and they're just uh, you know, I, I just you know I, I can't say enough good things about these guys. Everybody. Mm -hmm loves uh, <laughs> i know <laughs> yeah and women too we have a you know we work with a burmese we, women too yeah we have susan along as well so yeah yeah laura do you have some few words to end up this wonderful lecture and uh, once again steve i can tell you i will share all those comments i have received because they would make you so happy that's Tons of very nice response here on, on my right side of my laptop. So that tells me that it was a great lecture by you and Laura. Please take it over from here. And uh, I do like this, Steve. See you and the best to the family and <laughs> see you next time. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> thank yeah, you so much. From Steve. my side, thank you so much for tonight, Steve. It was an honor to have you with us and it was a pleasure hearing your stories and learning about the people in the images. And yeah everything around it thank you for tonight also to everyone who joined us and i hope we see you for our next better moments webinar enjoy the rest of your day or night depending where in the world you are and uh, yeah goodbye from my side as well burma is one of my favorite places in the world which is why i've been going there for probably more than three decades Burma evokes both curiosity and inspiration. I know the country very well and have many favorite places which I would love to share with you. I would like to invite you to join me there during my workshop in February of 2021. We will be working together and I'll be sharing with you my suggestions for light and composition, locations, uh, my approach to portraits, approaching people and, and landscapes. We'll explore some hidden places in Mandalay, as well as some well-known places I've been documenting for years, like the World Heritage Sites at Bagan. We will take part in Buddhist ceremonies, see historical sites, and fully immerse ourselves in the Burmese culture. People in Burma are extremely friendly, very willing to be photographed, 
pr and very proud of their culture and their heritage. It's a wonderful, safe place to create unforgettable images. Hope to see you there.